I was talking to a friend of mine who lives in the mountains of North Carolina about uh, the wilderness, right? That's been our theme of the last couple of weeks in the Lent in the wilderness. And I, I, I asked him, Dave, when you head out in the wilderness, what do you take with you? And, and you know how when you talk to someone who really knows what they're doing, they just, they know the answers right away? It was impressive. He could tell me, you know, Andy, if I'm going out for a day, I take this, 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 this. If I'm going out for two days, I add this, this. And then from three to ten days, then I just start adding how much food I have to carry. And uh, it was really impressive. I wouldn't know how much to carry if I was going out for five days in the woods, but he knew just off the top of his head what he, what he would need to carry. And so we were talking about this, and uh, he told me, I said, Andy, you know, my favorite trip to take is to pack up enough for two days and to go out somewhere beautiful, somewhere striking, a, a view from a mountaintop, a, a waterfall, just somewhere just beautiful. And to get there about mid-afternoon, kind of enjoy it, and spend the night, and then leave. And I thought, isn't that about right? Isn't that just a wonderful way to enjoy a spot? Because what comes so easily when, you know, you go on vacation and there's something beautiful to see, what, what, how do we usually appreciate it? On your left, you will see the 72-foot waterfall falling down. Okay, and moving on, now on your right, I mean, we, we tend to see things as a tourist. And the tourist way of doing things is you, you look, you read your little blurb in the guidebook, and then you move on. And what my friend was talking about was something far different, where you get somewhere beautiful and you sit there and you just kind of take it in for a minute. And after a while, you kind of get bored with it. So you make some dinner and set up camp and enjoy a meal and then you're set up for the night and then you enjoy it a little bit more after you've had dinner. And then you sleep on it and get up in the morning and you have coffee and then you sit with it a bit more in this beautiful place. And then... Then you leave. And you've had time to really be there. As he was describing this, uh, that fr phrase, be still and know that I am Lord, from the Psalms, came to mind. And I thought, man, he, he's nailed that. He's got that down. And, and I'm, Olivia and I uh, are planning, and Sophia, are planning on going out there this summer. And I, I hope to be able to do that with him so I can learn some, something of what he already knows. Well, as he was telling me this, I had a bit of a flashback to, to another time in the wilderness. Uh, a, my, a good friend of mine, Nicole, also someone I met in seminary, she's the one who taught me about the South. Growing up in Illinois, we would go down to Disney World to go see my grandpa, and I figured everything south of Illinois until Orlando was the South. It was just one big block of South. It was all the same, right? Well, not really. It's my friend Nicole who taught me the difference between Deep South, New South, New Orleans, and Appalachia. Those are all very different parts of South, aren't they? All, right. all have sweet tea, but besides that, they get very different from each other. And my friend grew up in Appalachia. And in Appalachia, if you don't, aren't familiar with the region, that is uh, the area of the country marked by the Appalachian Mountains. And it is poor. It is poor as poor can be. They didn't get involved in the Civil War, or they didn't want to, because they were too poor to own slaves. They were just poor. But it's also beautiful. Appalachia is simply beautiful. And so Nicole and I, on occasion, when we had a break from school, we would go over to Appalachia to uh, enjoy two things. We'd enjoy the shopping over at Pigeon Forge, over by Dollywood. We didn't actually go to Dollywood, because... That would just be weird. But uh, then we would, uh, they had a, there's a knife shop there, Smoky Mountain Knife Works, where they have a stuffed elephant head. And the place is so big that the stuffed elephant head is just part of the decor. It's not even the centerpiece. It's just part of it. It's just, it's heaven. I love it. It's great. But we go there, and then Nicole and I would go take a hike and enjoy the, the wilderness, enjoy the nature. And uh, one time, she's wanted to bring me to this waterfall she had been to that she'd been back to many times, and she just loved it. And uh, so we got on our hiking boots, and we set out. And, and we got out there, and, and we came around. The, we'd been hiking up, up some mountains, and it's a very close forest. And we came around the corner, and there it was. This, it's, it, was a, it was a kind of a low waterfall, but it was wide, and it poured down into this great wide pool, and the, the forest was all coming up over you, and it was just beautiful. And, and as I, I looked at it, and we had not communicated clearly or something, because I 
thought that we were going to see this and then like keep on going out farther and, and there would be some other stuff and then we'd like come back, maybe see it on the way back. And, and so I thought we were going to keep on going and, and I didn't realize that, that that was it. We were coming out for that and then we're going to turn around and go back. And so I said, that, that's very cool. And, and I got up to like go and Nicole did and she led the way off and we started going back the way I came. And to this day, I feel like a dog just an utter fool for not saying, wait a minute, I misunderstood. We're not coming back this... For not saying, okay, I, I missed, let, let's go back and sit. Because I don't know if I'll ever go, be able to go back to that place. And, and I, I whiffed. I should have just sat and been still and known something that you can only know from just being still and knowing that God is God and this is beautiful and instead I was a fool. All right? Be still and know that I am Lord. I acted like a tourist that day. Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, he is the dude who faces down the original Jezebel. Jezebel and Ahab, their king and queen of Israel. And Ahab, you know, he's not an immoral guy. He's not choosing to be evil. He's not a moral guy. He is something far different and actually far worse. He is amoral. He just doesn't care about right and wrong. He wants to build up the nation and whatever it takes is what it takes. And so he builds up the economy and he builds up the military might and he builds up the political standing of, of Israel. And he doesn't care about right and wrong. He's just doing his job, right? And so part of building up the nation of Israel is he marries Jezebel, who is a princess of a neighboring kingdom. And Jezebel, she brings with her her God, her faith. And, and you can actually hear it in the name, Jezebel. B-E-L at the end. That's a form of Baal. B-A-A-L, you read about in the Old Testament. So her God, she is named after her God. And so it's not a surprise that she brings with her 450 prophets of her God. 450 prophets of Baal, and then another 400 prophets of Asherah, of this other fertility cult type thing. Um, and so they bring with, she brings that in, and Ahab doesn't care. He's just trying to build up the kingdom. And Elijah confronts them and says, because of the way you're doing things, there's going to be a drought upon the land, and there is. And after three years of drought, Elijah confronts Ahab and confronts the 450 priests of Baal, and they have this, this classic showdown where uh, each of them take a, a, a beast, a, a bull, and, and they cut it up and they, and they sacrifice it, and, and each of them build an altar, and the prophets of Baal go first. They get to pick the time, pick the place, or pick the... Uh, the time of day they get to go, and so they have all the advantages, and uh, they start trying to get God to li their God to light this bull on fire, right? And so they start cutting themselves to sort of like tease their God into do this, and they start hollering louder. And Elijah's over here, and he starts mocking them. You know, maybe you need to holler louder because your God does your God need a hearing aid? I hear they're getting a lot better at that. Or you know, maybe your God's taking a nap. You need to holler, or maybe you know, just slice a little bit deeper, and he'll pay attention. So they. Elijah is just mocking them. And then uh, after a while, Elijah says, okay, my turn. And he steps up to the, the, the bull he has cut up, and it's all right there on the altar. And, and the altar is built of, of 12 stones for the 12 tribes of Israel. And in the middle of a drought, he says, dig a trench and start dumping water. Multiple times they dump water onto the, the, this bull. And, uh, and Elijah prays out loud before the people saying, God, could you please show them that you are true, that you are real? And, and the bull explodes into flames and then the crowd turns into a mob and lights into the 450 prophets of Baal. And Elijah says, don't let any of them get away. And they are all massacred. We don't read it quite like that in our Sunday school lesson, do we? But no, they are all massacred. And then uh, Ahab goes back to tell Jezebel that she just lost 450 of her servants. And uh, Jezebel is a little bit angry. And so she threatens Elijah. And he runs. And that's where we pick up on our reading today is he is running. And, and he runs and... Uh, we're not quite sure why. I mean, the dude has just faced down all the prophets of Baal. He has just been one verse 450 and dude came out on top. So is he running because he's tired? I mean, he has fought the good fight and now there's more fight to fight and he's just, ugh. 
Is he running because he realizes he might have gone too far? I mean, the dude just did slaughter 450 people. That's not considered good form, usually. And uh, is he running because he, he's gone overboard? Maybe. We're not sure. What we do know is, what we do know is that Elijah is having this sort of midlife crisis, or, or maybe more accurately, a mid-faith crisis, because he is just not sure how this is going to work out. And so he runs... And we pick up the story here, and the story is told in a certain way. The story is told with a sense of repetition. You might have noticed that Elijah whines in the exact same way twice. And what that is, it's a setup to try to point our eyes towards what matters most. It's a way of storytelling where you start, you sort of lead up. Elijah leaves Israel, whines to God, God shows up. Elijah whines again, and then he goes back to Israel. There's sort of an arc there. And it was meant to draw our eyes towards the center of, of the story, the, the thing that happens right in the middle, which is when God shows up. And so that's what we will pay attention to today. When we see God showing up, does God show up in the wind that shatters rocks? No. Does God show up in the earthquake that shakes the ground beneath his feet? No. Does God show up in the fire that burns past? No. God shows up in something that is one of the hardest words to translate in the Bible. Most of the Bible we know how to translate. This is the one of the few places where we just, we're not sure. If you open different Bibles, one of them will say, sheer silence. God's voice was in the sheer silence. Others will say, a still small voice. Some will say, a gentle blowing. If you read it literally, what it says literally is the voice of a thin whisper, or maybe of thin thunder. What the heck is that? I don't know either. But it's something, and it ain't the big, huge events. It's not the, the thunder, it's not the lightning, it's not the earthquake, it is something far different. What I would like to know though, and it doesn't tell us, but I'm going to guess that Elijah probably had to wait a while for this, didn't he? Think about, think about what it'd be like if you're sitting on the side of the mountain and you're waiting for God to show up, and the first thing that happens is the wind whips through that shatters rocks, and then the next thing happens is the whole earth shakes, and then a fire comes by, and then well, what's next? What are you waiting for? I mean, he's just sitting there waiting for something big, and how long would you wait? for something big before you realize that what you were waiting for was something that was like a thin whisper? It'd take a while, right? You'd probably sit there, probably get bored after a while, make yourself some dinner, sleep on it, get up in the morning, have some coffee, well, whatever they drank back then, and uh, it, would, you, it would take a while to get from trying to look for a really big event Till being ready to hear God in the sheer thin silence. He was probably there a while. After he heard whatever it is he heard, God asks, so what you doing here? And he complains again, and then he is sent back into Israel with a renewed something. Uh, he has gotten through this mid-faith crisis, and he has done it. He has been still known that God is God, and even though he's still whining, he now goes back to train his successor, Elisha, and he knows that there are still 7,000 who are still faithful, and he's going to go anoint the next king, and he, he goes back to do his thing. There are many people who in life hit what Elijah hit, a mid-faith crisis, a mid-life crisis. It could be in the middle of your life. It could be when you retire and all of a sudden your life is not wrapped up in your job anymore. I'm hearing more and more about something called a quarter-life crisis. People who come out of college in their like late 20s and what are they going to do with themselves and all of a sudden like adult life and they're just not... I don't know if you've heard this quarter-life crisis. Look it up online. It, it's interesting reading. I'm, I've always been too busy for a quarter-life crisis, but people have these things. And uh, when such events happen, there is this draw to get into the wilderness, to get away, to, to go and, and get your head on straight and to find what you need to find. And there is one particular way of doing this that tends to be very popular in America. Have you all ever heard of the Appalachian Trail? Right? Appalachian Trail. It runs through Appalachia. It goes from Georgia to Maine. It is 
2,138 miles. And it takes six months to hike. And there are 2,000 people every year who hike this, who, who set out to hike the whole thing. I mean, if you think about that, it, what would it look like for you to get to a point in your life where you needed to go hike for six months, right? This is not, hey, let's take a vacation. This is at the point of, I need to get my life straight. I need to get figured out where I'm going with myself. I need to get figure out something important. This is very similar to, like, Elijah, he takes 40 days to get to the mountain. However long he's on the mountain, 40 days back, that's three, four months right there. I mean, this is very similar to a similar length of time out in the wilderness. And so, of those 2,000 people who attempt to go from Georgia to Maine every year, you know how many people actually make it? One quarter. 500 people make it out of 2,000 who set out every year. What about those 1,500? Those 1,500 who set out in Georgia and they're going to hike north and they're going to hike for six months, are they failures? Some of them, probably. I mean, some of them, if you asked them, their goal would be, you know, I was going to hike the Appalachian Trail and 700 miles in, my boots gave out and I had to quit. I mean, some of them probably were our failures. But what I want to suggest to you is that if you go on a six-month hike, you're trying to do what Elijah did, or probably are doing that. And if you come up the hill one day, 1,200, 1,500 miles in, and you have that moment where you hear that still, small, thin voice, whatever it is, and you have that moment and you know that you've been still and known that God is God and you know what's next, I'm guessing a lot of people have that moment. And then they say, okay, I'm done now. And they leave the trail. Because... How far do you have to go till you have that moment? You have to go till, till you have it. There's no set length. You just go till you have that moment, right? And I think that's what I want to leave you with today. This idea that if you're seeking to, to be still and know that God is God, if you're even potentially struggling with a mid-faith crisis or will one day, I want you to know that when you go out to have this experience like Elijah had, how long does it take? Well, it takes as long as it takes. For some, like my friend David, it, it takes just going out there and being out overnight. That's what it works for him. For some, it takes hiking the Appalachian Trail. For Elijah, it took hiking out to Mount Sinai. For you, it might take something else completely. But if you want to be still and know that God is God and figure out what's next to your life, well, be still and be still till you get it figured. How long will that take? I don't know. It takes what it takes. Amen.